Welcome. I'm Tita Chico, Professor of English and uh, Faculty Director of the Center for Literary and Comparative Studies at the University of Maryland. We convene this year-long series on anti-racism to act on statements of solidarity for Black Lives Matter issued by the department, the college, and the university. We also convene this series to honor and to highlight the long-standing commitment among many English department faculty and students to anti-racist scholarship and teaching. To be clear, in this series, anti-racism is the intellectual starting point for humanistic literary inquiry. It is not an add-on. Black Lives Matter. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Jacob Blake, Daniel Prude. Black Lives Matter. We're meeting virtually today, but we are grounded by our institutional home, the University of Maryland. With this series, we celebrate the memory of Second Lieutenant Richard Collins III, a young Black man who was about to graduate when, on May 20th, 2017, he was murdered by a white supremacist at a campus bus stop. Eight days ago, on the 1st of October, 2020, the Second Lieutenant Richard W. Collins III law went into effect in the state of Maryland. It is hate crime legislation lobbied for by his parents. Before, hate had to be the sole reason for a crime. Now, only in part. My colleague, Professor Zita C. Nunez, recently interviewed Mrs. Collins and asked what the title of their conversation should be. Mrs. Collins answered, meanwhile, he is loved. Richard Collins III. Black Lives Matter. We're meeting virtually today, yet the university is on land we now call the state of Maryland, 10 miles from Capitol Hill, the seat of the US federal government. And our campus grounds, they are the original homelands of the Anacostan and Piscataway tribal nations. We see flecks of this indigenous history remembered and yet forgotten in the names of campus buildings, Susquehanna, Chicoteague. The University of Maryland was built in the mid 19th century through wealth extracted from enslaved black men, women, and children. The first trustees were slaveocrats. 80 years later, Thurgood Marshall was refused admission to the law school. But, and, the 1850 and 1860 census documents 12 members of the Adams family and four households adjacent to campus. And Adam Francis Plummer was an enslaved black man owned by the founder of the university, Charles Benedict Calvert, a step nephew owned by his step uncle. But Adam Francis Plummer, he left us his diary. Historical records demand our full critical and creative attention. They demand stories. In her 1993 Nobel Prize lecture, Toni Morrison reminded us that narrative is not merely entertainment, but one of the principal ways we absorb knowledge. The 12 members of the Adams family, Adam Francis Plummer, what are their stories? Meanwhile, as Mrs. Collins tells us, he is loved. The Center's Anti-Racism series is co-sponsored by the University Libraries, the Graduate School's Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and the Petru Foundation. With this support, we are able to commit to making these events accessible with live captioning. And you'll find the live captioning link in the Treadwell, Typewell window, excuse me. For those of you on Twitter, our hashtags for conversation are hashtag anti-racismUMD and hashtag CLCS underscore UMD. I want to thank Danielle uh, Griffin and Liam Daly, the center's graduate assistants, and a very special thank you to Dr. Karen Nelson, co-director of the center and director of research initi initiatives for the department. Our program will be an hour. Our guests will be in conversation for each other for 30 minutes, after which my colleague, Rian Amilkar Scott, will come back to moderate the Q&A. 
Now, I ask that you please join me in welcoming Victor Laval and class of 2019's Keon Kelly Chung. Thank you. Hello, can everyone see hey, you? Hey, I see you at least. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> good to see you, man. How are you? Good to see you too. It's good to see you too. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm all right. I like your I like your surroundings. Uh... Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to I wanted to put myself somewhere in nature, you know, ground myself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it looks good. It looks good. I'm just in our my family's bedroom in our apartment, uh, which is a, another kind of grounding. Another kind of grounding. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so firstly, before we even jump into this one, I, I wanted to, to first say to uh, to Tita, to Professor Chico, thank you so much for this. This is such an amazing opportunity. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you to the to the English department. Thank you to Arts and Humanities. This is this is quite quite a quite an experience for me. I'm very happy to be here, and 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 to you, Victor, as well. I'm very happy to to be able to have this opportunity to speak with you on such an important such an important topic and, and, and in such an important time right now. Um, sure. I feel this exactly the same, just as honored to be yeah. here. Um, now, I, I know that we, we, we're gonna get into, this, into a whole bunch of really deep, deep conversations, but I wanted to first start off a little bit more lighthearted, right? Mm -hmm. It is October, it's, it's spooky season right now. For sure. I'm getting close to Halloween, it's coming up. And um, I, I, I know that you, you the, the work that introduced me to you, at least, was Destroyer, right? Mm -hmm. this, this is a Black Lives Matter interpretation of Frankenstein, right? And, and kind of, let's, 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 let's kind of dive a little deep here and, and, and kind of keeping on with the, with the spooky season vibes right now um, and, and Destroyer and everything in Frankenstein. I, I just want to kind of hear from you i know we talked a little bit briefly yesterday but i want to hear from you again about some of your inspiration behind creating destroyer um especially now oh sure uh well the simplest explanation is uh my wife is a writer as well and she was teaching frankenstein uh in a class she was teaching called the literature of birth uh and uh um and she and i was she was saying to me i think you should read that book again uh you probably haven't read it in a long time um, and you probably don't remember how radical a text it was. She was just enjoying it and enjoying teaching it, uh, particularly in that kind of radical political perspective. Uh, so I read it again, and I was reminded exactly how forward thinking and radical that original text is. And anybody who hasn't read it, I mean, it's just Mary Shelley writes this um, book that is uh, really on, in some ways like 100, 150 years ahead of its time. Uh, it's absolutely a sort of question on the verge of uh, the scientific sort of advances that Europe at that time was going through and the idea of we're leaving behind the age where religion or God is the answer for everything to the time where science perhaps is the answer for everything. But what does that mean? And her novel becomes this, not only the story of a sort of, you say like a cautionary tale about a scientist who takes things too far, but also like a, the question of hubris because he's a great scientist and he's incredibly intelligent, but the question is, where does one draw the line? Where is their humility, even in the face of great advancement, even in the face of great power? And, uh, and then even in small ways, it's an incredibly advanced or forward thinking book because people don't always remember this, but the, the, the creature in the book is a vegan. Uh, and that's because um, Mary Shelley and her mother were vegan. And so in that novel, it only eats berries and nuts and leaves. So this is a small thing, but I always feel like that's a fun thing to do. That's a good thing. I didn't even pick up on that. That's a good yes. thing. It's a, it's a nice touch. It's a nice yeah. touch. But uh, all that is to say, so I read that and I felt like this is like a genuinely politically radical text. Um, and so it wasn't so much that I wanted to retell it because I felt like Mary Shelley did an amazing job for her period of time that she was wrestling with the things of her time. So I thought, what if I could just continue it? Because at the end of the novel, the creature is still alive. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought like, um, well, maybe we could just find out like where it ended up. And at the end of the novel, one member of the Frankenstein extended family survives the rampage of the, uh, of the creature. And so I decided maybe that family member would feel like maybe Europe hadn't been so good to them. So they came to the US, 
maybe they settled somewhere out west, and maybe their great granddaughter would be the last remaining Frankenstein, uh, and she would also be a black woman nanotechnologist. Uh, and I put all those things together, and that became Destroyer. Wow. Wow, that's 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 absolutely amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Thanks. And um, and I, what you were talking about the whole idea of hubris and and kind of talking about Mary Shelley's version of Frankenstein. What well, version of Frankenstein? It's her. It's her novel. It's her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh. You know, this whole idea of, of of taking things too far, right? And one of the things, the themes that I always felt was true about Frankenstein was this whole idea of who actually has control over human life. Who gets to decide who lives and who dies? And I think you also touch a lot on this in Destroyer, but in a different lens, because again, now we're looking at this through the frame of Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking, and we're, we're looking at this with the same context of all of these police officers and even self-appointed vigilantes who are taking that responsibility and that power into their own hands when they don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. when they're deciding within split seconds to shoot 12 year olds, right? To shoot 14 year olds, to shoot innocent people, people who are sleeping in their own homes, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think that what you do with Destroyer is you really touch upon that point. You know, who gets to have control over when and how we die? Right. And, you know, depending on who you are, maybe if you're religious, you might say God does. You know, if you're not, maybe you just say it is, is what it is, right? But the other thing that I think that I really absolutely loved about Destroyer, and again, I'm sending all my praises to Mary Shelley and Frankenstein, but the one thing I think that you did um, with Destroyer that I like so much more um, is that the, the reincarnation, the reanimation aspect that we see in Destroyer has such a more personal impact. It's, it's not done out of selfishness the way that uh, Victor Frankenstein does, where he does it in a way where he just wants to say, hey, I can do this. I'm the first right. one that can do this. I have control over life. Whereas here, uh, Josephine Baker, Dr. Baker, is trying to reanimate her, her stolen son, mm -hmm. right? Her murdered son. You know, she's trying to bring back this life that, was, that never should have been lost in the first place. And I think that that is the, one of the strongest differences between Frankenstein and, and, and Destroyer that I really appreciate what you did in this book. Um, not to say that, that, that what Shelley's talking about isn't valid. Everything that she's saying in that book is also valid. Um, I, just, I just really appreciated, I really appreciated what you were doing with that. Um, now, I, I, I do wanna, I, I do wanna touch a lot more on, on, on Destroyer as well, but I do have some other more lighthearted questions. <laughs> Uh, before we go even deeper, um, I want to go back to the to the spooky vibes. Mm. Let's go back to Halloween time, and you know I'm thinking about Halloween costumes. Okay. Right now, a lot of people dress up as Frankenstein for Halloween. Maybe hopefully this time around we'll see some people dressing up as Dr. Baker for Halloween. <laughs> I would like that. Yes. yes. <laughs> or her son for Halloween. Um, but, you know, one of the things, and right now we're here in this discussion and we're trying to talk about uh, issues of racism. And I think that Halloween costumes have historically been, for many people, very racist, right? Um, and I'm just curious to hear some of your thoughts on this. You know, uh, uh, some of the things that we've seen, I guess most recently, as far as racist Halloween costumes, is like people dressing up in blackface or sure. people dressing up as natives or indigenous mm -hmm. peoples or people dressing up as uh, Mexicans and just wearing the sombreros and things like that. And uh, I'm just curious to kind of hear your thoughts on, on, on these racist Halloween costumes. Well, I mean, I, I think the thing that's interesting about Halloween, just broadly speaking, right, is the idea, be, the idea that uh, it's a moment when well, two different things, right? Uh, the idea that it's the moment when people sort of put on a different sort of skin, right? A different face. Um, and there's one 
train of thought, the old, maybe in some ways the older train of thought where Halloween comes from, right? Where the idea is that you put on these costumes because the dead on that day, the sort of barrier between the living and the dead is at its thinnest. So you don't want the, you don't want the dead to see you for who you truly are, mm -hmm. right? You want to hide. And so you put on a costume so that you look like them, so that you can move through the world on that night without being bothered by the spirits, right? Shift that to the more modern question you're talking about, about Halloween costumes. I do find it very interesting, like, um, and I think this is a thing that on a certain level, maybe you or I might not be even the people who can talk about it, but I'm always fascinated uh, by the people who do dress up in one way or, the, or another in some kind of like, um, racial or sexual or uh, provocative or like downright racist, sexist, anti-whatever sort of costumes, like why that is the choice they make. Like why is that the, the sort of body they think they want to live in, right? Like I know some people, like they might say like, oh, it's just for fun. But I think it's tapping into something deeper and more psychologically complicated that perhaps even they can't acknowledge that they need to think about or mm. talk about. Right. Is it like um, I just remember having a friend who said, like, oh, the reason they do that is because they don't like how they look. So mm. they want to look like us. Right. And I feel like that's too positive a take on things. Mm. Right. Um, but I do think there's something uh, profound about the idea of like how or why people uh, choose the costumes they do and the kind of uh, license they think that gives them. Right. And then so to give you an idea, I'm just going to show you. So my our older son, we have his mask for Halloween here. He's nine. He's going to be Pennywise. Yeah. Right. Um, and oh. yeah. And and uh, and he but he talked we, like we asked him, like, why do you want to be Pennywise? And he just said, like, uh, he's just so powerful. And like nobody could scare me if I was the scariest person around. Mm. Right. And so I felt like that was like a deep insight into him and him telling me about what he fears. Right. He fears being powerless. He's a kid. He is powerless. Essentially, me and his, me and my wife tell him what to do all the time. And he really hates it. Uh, and I feel like in, I'm not comparing the two, but I do think if the people who dress that way could be forced to sit down and have a real conversation about how or why. Um, this is the choice of all the choices you could make. You made the worst choice possible. Mm -hmm. Why do you keep making bad choices? That would be sort of like my way of asking, of like talking with them and trying to understand uh, and trying to figure out like uh, what is behind all of this. You know? so, so it's funny. <laughs> this to me seems like a euphemism for why are you racist? <laughs> Well, that's exactly, I mean, but that's exactly right. But like, uh, the, I think the funny thing is, I mean, I do find it hilarious at this stage now that like, um, seemingly in the US, the worst thing you can be is racist. Mm. But incredibly racist people will enact racist practices all the time or act racist, whatever. But if you say like you're being racist, it's the that I'm not racist. I just want children in cages until they get sent across the border, right? That's not racist. That's just my immigration policy. And you're like, no, it's just racist. It just is racist. Uh, but like, it's the term. Yes, exactly. The term weirdly that they get kind of like they get stuck on it like a tick, right? Uh, I think it's because racism itself. When you get called a racist, it's like being branded a scarlet letter, right? Well, now, I mean, but I think that's one of the things that I think I do think is interesting is that 20, even 20 years ago, 30 years ago, if you ask that question, you'd have, I think, a fair number of people who might say so, at least, and definitely 40, 50 years ago, I'm proudly that, right? I absolutely say that this is the way it should be. And I think this race should be on top. I absolutely think that that's normal and right. Yeah. And so I do think it's interesting that even for those people, they have learned, no, I shouldn't. I shouldn't say I like that. I need euphemisms for that, right? I need to say like, well, if you just followed the rule of law, you'd never have trouble with the cops. And you say, well, here's a person who followed the rule of law entirely. In fact, they were just sleeping. And still, they died. And you say like, well, they shouldn't have been sleeping there. 
and you go, okay, I got you. But they're in their own home. <laughs> yes. You know? Um, so yeah, I, I, and I see it now we're, we're this conversation is already going great. Um, and we're, uh, <laughs> okay. we're going, we're going, we're, we're running through the time. We're running through the time. I have so many other questions I want to ask you. Um, wow. And I have this one question right here and like, I wanted to move on, but I feel like I have to ask it. Okay. Dressing up as a cop for Halloween. Are you asking if I'm going to do that? I'm not asking. Uh, you. No, I'm probably not. I'm asking, I'm, asking, I'm asking now because I'm thinking about, you know, your story and exactly what you were just telling me with your son and this whole idea of, fearing being powerless mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about why people become cops mm -hmm. right and I feel as though a lot of it is because of that same fear a fear that they were once powerless and I, I I'm this is me projecting this is me assuming things mm -hmm. here but I, I I think that a lot of it is is a sense of powerlessness and then they get to experience that power once they don the blue uniform they get the badge and they get the gun Right. And so I'm thinking about this back to to these Halloween costumes. And I'm not trying to say that dressing up as a police officer is inherently racist. But what I am considering, though, is how much trauma is and, and psychological torment there is on the black community just by seeing a police officer mm. and what that can do. Like I, like for me now. And just because I've been, I've spent so much time, uh, I spent the past four months documenting the Black Lives Matter movement here in mm -hmm. DC. Mm -hmm. And my relationship with the police, I mean, I, I never really liked police before, but now I really don't like the police. Mm -hmm. Like I really don't like them at all. And I'm thinking about this and I'm like, well, Halloween's coming up. There's gonna be a whole bunch of kids who are probably gonna wanna dress up as cops, right? And now I'm not gonna be afraid of, you know, a six-year-old <laughs> who comes to my door uh -huh. saying trick or treat dressing up as a cop but I might be a little afraid if their dad does mm -hmm. you know I might sure. I might that like I'm I'm not going to go too deep into all the things that I've experienced but I can assure you right now that in my four months of time documenting the Black Lives Matter movement here in DC I am struggling with PTSD yeah. like 100% you know and for instance, I was driving home one time and I had a flashback by looking at these traffic cones and I thought that the reflectors on the top of the traffic cones were the lights on the paddy wagon. Yeah. And I'm driving and for a good quick second, I was in a completely different place. Yeah. Like that is what's happening here. And so I'm thinking about this whole idea of dressing up as a cop, as a police officer and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's not something that should affect me it's not something that should have any power over me. But the problem is, is that our country has set it up in a way where it does. Mm -hmm. And that this has been a generational curse for the black community, right? That we have been undermined and undervalued and, and oppressed by not just the police, but the whole system that the police exists in, right? For sure. And I think that whenever, and I think that the thing that, that fears me the most about seeing officers, even the actual officer themselves, it's knowing that that person is subscribing to, to a system that is literally designed to keep me down, to, to keep me in jail, to keep me from being able to progress, to keep me from being able to live, to keep me from being able to breathe, right? So I think that that's, that, that's, what, that's what scares me the most about it. Um, well, I would say, I think the difficult thing about uh, any system, all systems, right? Uh, if you're talking about like uh, culture, government, corporations, uh, is that people can become parts of those systems without even necessarily recognizing the ways that they are becoming part of a system, right? So I'm more than willing to bet there's more than enough folks who become cops just because it's a good job, right? Like it just pays the bills. Yeah. And they saw people in the neighborhood who did these things. Uh, same way, like I can say like, um, uh, we have wonderful teachers at our kids' school, right? And the school that they're in in particular, um, it's a school in the neighborhood and uh, we're very lucky that from the principal all the way down, they take very seriously all these different ways of sort of um, 
talking through and deprogramming some of the sort of basic blind spots that teaching in the American public school system has set up. So for instance, the idea of just like which kids get uh, sent to the principal's office and which don't, which kids get written up for infractions and which don't. Uh, but our, we're so, our principal all the way through down to our teachers and the staff, they're all consciously thinking about this and talking about this mm -hmm. so that from kindergarten to fifth grade, which is what our kids are in, um, they're really trying to be aware of the ways that the systems, it's just very easy to not have to think about it. Yeah. And the system has just has a current that will take you in a certain direction. Yeah. And that current is, I think, what all of us uh, in one way or the other are, if we're trying to be aware, are trying to fight against. Because yeah. one way or the other, there's probably a current, uh, even down to like, I'll just order it off Amazon versus I'll walk to the store and buy it from my local shop. Right. It's a little it takes a little longer to get to your shop. Well, it doesn't actually. I mean, but I mean, it takes a few extra steps and it probably does cost a tiny bit more. Right. But the, this, the difference in what that uh, but that choice to go do that is another way that one is, in theory, swimming against the current. Yeah. And I do think the beauty of at least the current moment for me, at least considering, you know, uh, so I would say for my age, I do feel gratified i do think it's really beautiful um like seeing uh say in particular like the black lives matter movement become not just a thing that happens over one summer but that has become as far as i'm concerned like uh one of the great political movements of this time yeah and and, and real quick because i i want to i want to say something real quick and i want to ask another question before we move to the q a mm. um but i think you know one of the things about the black lives matter movement that we're seeing just to build off of your point is that this is more than just a movement it's a mindset mm -hmm. right it is a belief and when that is the truth then it will it has to exist past just the summer we're in the fall now that's right right we're in october this started when back in in may it's not going to stop and i don't think that anyone has any intentions of letting this stop anytime soon until yeah. justice is served until things change until this country becomes a safe place for black people to live, right? I think that is going to be the truth. And I think that we, we started this back in, we started this as soon as the system was created against us. Yes. We've been fighting against it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And it only takes a matter of time for people to say, enough is enough, now is the time, and it's not gonna be tomorrow. I, I, what did James Baldwin say? This is one of my favorite quotes from James Baldwin. He says, you tell me it's going to take time for my, for progress. It's taking my, my, my father's time, my mother's time, my uncle's and my, and my aunt's time, my nieces and my nephew's time. How much time do you want for your progress? And, and I agree with him wholeheartedly. It, it's, we don't want any more time. We want it now. Right. And I think that that's where we are. We are we're, we're demanding it now and we're going to continue fighting until we get it now. Now, before we move into the q and I want to ask this, this quick question because we talked about this on the phone yesterday and you were just bringing up academia and systems and things like that. And I think you might know what question I'm about to ask, but I wanted to do it here because especially here with, with UMD because my experience at University of Maryland is largely part of the reason why I have this particular mindset about this. And it's a good thing. It's because the university had enlightened me to a completely different perspective on what the English major actually is, right? I studied so many different things. And, and, and the English major, you know, I didn't just study Shakespeare. I didn't just study Mary Shelley. I didn't just study the white canonized authors, right? We also, st we studied you right? <laughs> we, we studied James Baldwin. We studied uh, so many different authors from so many different places, books that were, that had to get translated. We kind of talked about that uh, briefly uh, on the phone yesterday. And I guess kind of we're, we're and not even just books, but all different forms of literature, right? We, we talked about how, you know, the idea of what literature is over the 
the generations has transformed and has expanded and it's no longer just plain text prose bound up in this hardback novel. It is now also graphic novels. It is now also cinema. It is now also video games. It is now also virtual reality. It is now also, uh, I remember in my 301 class at UMD, uh, we went as far as to say that text messages were a form of literature, that subtitles were a form of literature. And I think that this is what, I, what I'm getting at, and, and, and is that things evolve, right? And personally, we're here, we're talking about racism. We're here, we're, we're trying to address the problems of white supremacy. I personally feel as though that the actual studies that we are learning in the English department is more about you know literary studies than it is about actually English, right? And I think that when we that when we are trying to equate or th throw all of these different forms of literature, all these amazing forms of literature under this umbrella that is English, that we are then trying to say that the only things that are worth studying must therefore be attributed to a white language, and it's then this kind of idea of of upholding another white supremacist ideology, right? So I, 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 and again, I loved my time being an English major and I'm very proud to have a degree in English. Very, very proud. But again, I think it's the fact that I went through that, that study and I've been able to be exposed to so many different types of literature, to so many different authors, to so many different directors from all these different places and got that in the English department here at UMD that has allowed me even the room to even think about that, right? So I'm just curious, you know, we talked about it a little bit briefly. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Like, like does the English, is, is, is calling what we study in English, English upholding white supremacy? I guess that's, that's my question. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think the, uh, what we had discussed was the idea of like the, uh, <clears throat> like in brief, like the, the history of even like the creation of, of English departments, right? And that the, uh, the, 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 the long history of it is really that English departments on some level arose post what is called the dark ages in Europe and the need to reclaim texts, texts that had essentially disappeared from common knowledge and study. Right. And so since we're since the U.S. is also following this British uh, sort of tradition, right, since that's where uh, the, those uh, colonists, some of those colonists came from, um, the study of English became the reclamation of that cu that culture's literature. And over time, the sort of net just grew wider and wider and wider. But much like I was saying a minute ago about systems, Universities are just another system. Programs are just another system. And all systems take a lot longer to evolve than individuals do. Mm -hmm. And so we were saying like, uh, potentially at some point in the 21st century, the English department gets turned into the literature department, say. Or you'd suggested like the, what was a critical thinking department or something like that, that that would seem like a, a way that would acknowledge that by now, what any student is studying in a program is uh, ex is expands far beyond what the English language and English culture has uh, created. Uh, but uh, the truth is, um, a lot of buildings have the word English on them. A lot of uh, uh, stationery has a lot has the word English on it, and lot it's going to take a while for them to run through those things before they put up the, uh, you know, I mean, you got like, I mean, it seems silly, but in all seriousness, just, I can imagine a conversation just saying like, well, we can't change it from English to literature as a department because it costs $50,000 to put this plaque up. And what are we going to do? Where are we going to get another plaque? If you're wishing for one person is $50,000. They just need to, they just need to have, they just need to admit one person and all of a sudden all that literature is printed. They, they made their money. I don't think that's how universities think of things. Uh, <laughs> it don't go, it's not a one for one. It's a, uh, you know, the funny thing like, a, um, so for books, one of the things we talk about is like, you get uh, your royalty rate, right? And the royalty rate, so like if your book costs $20, 
when that book sells, you don't get $20, you get a dollar, mm. right? And if you're lucky, you get a dollar. And so I think the university is somewhat similar. If somebody pays $50,000 for tuition, the department gets a dollar. Right, right. And then, <laughs> and then things move forward from there. <laughs> So, so really, so really what we're talking about now is that it's all, it's all about capitalism. Capitalism is racist. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's as fine a summary as we're going to get. There we go. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Okay. I have, I have more questions. Uh, my dog is here trying to say hello. I, I have more questions, but I, I know that we also need to make time for the Q&A. Tita, do, we ha do I have time to ask another question or should we just move on? Uh, go ahead, ask another question, and then Rihanna will come on. Okay, okay. okay thanks. This is this is my last question here, um, and I want to I'm gonna pivot now to where we are now, right? Mm -hmm. We're in the Black Lives Matter movement. A lot of things have happened over this summer, over this year. I mean, not only we're in the Black Lives Matter movement, well, movement revolution, honestly. Um, but it's happening also in the midst of this global pandemic. Um, so this is all, this is all insane, but you know, um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts now on, you know, where we are in the movement and where, do, where, where, where do you think we're going? What it, where, where should we go from here? Honestly, the first place we should go is to the voting booths. Ah. On November 3rd. Uh, and uh, like, I, honestly, I, I think the, it's an interesting moment. I remember seeing, uh, reading an interview with uh, George Saunders and Cheryl Stray. They were talking with each other. And this was early on in the pandemic. But she asked him, like, um, what if you have writers who want to write about the pandemic now as we're in the middle of things? Like, and this is, you know, uh, May or so, May or June. And he, I thought he, he put it well. He said, um, when you're falling off a horse, you don't have time to take notes. <laughs> uh, and he said, but after you finish your tuck and roll and you make sure the horse has not trampled you and you have not broken any bones, then you can get up and you can think about it. And I really feel like we are still falling off the horse. I am really, really hoping in all seriousness I mean, considering like earlier today, uh, the FBI arrested seven uh, ter uh, militia terrorists who were going to, um, uh, white militia terrorists who were planning to kidnap and essentially kill uh, the, the, the governor from Michigan. Uh, they've, they picked them up today, right? And uh, uh, so that feels to me like still part of the fall. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I, without overstating it, I really feel like um, the fall that America is in, we're either going to roll from this and be bruised or fall and break our necks. Yeah. And that's really, I feel like, the situation where we are now. And so at this point, I just want everybody to tuck and roll and let's survive this. And then we can figure out how to fix this. Like, I can't even think that far ahead. I just want us all to live. Yes, 100%, 100%. I agree with you on that. Um, uh, if I can, I, if I, I just want to add my, my own little thoughts here before we can move to my head. Um, just because I've been marching in the streets for the past four months. Um, I've, been, I've been shot at by rubber bullets, by, by MPD. I've been pepper sprayed. Um, they arrested me, they, they've done all this stuff and literally all I've done is gone out there with a camera, right? Just documenting and it's, it's insane, everything that has happened and there's so much, it's, it's so much deeper than I think people can actually even understand, right? Like the fact that I know personally of people who are out here fighting against a racist police force, fighting against a racist government, um, and are facing over a hundred years, which is way more time than the murderers of Breonna Taylor. They're not even facing any time. That's right. The actual person who fired the lethal round that killed Breonna Taylor was not charged with anything. 
but yet someone can go to a march, get assaulted by five bike cops, and then be charged with assault on a police officer, and then be facing 10 plus years. So as far as where we are in the movement, I think that what that tells me is that the police are scared. They are afraid of us winning. They are afraid that their way of life, of being able to continue to perpetuate these, this racist system, to continue to kill black people at will, to, to arrest people and, and falsely accuse them of all kinds of things, to continue to plant drugs in people's cars, I mean, all of these things, everything that they've existed and stood on, the fact that the police as a system was founded originally to catch, quote unquote, fugitive slaves, which in truth just means that they were there to round up black people and put them into a prison industrial complex that is just a rebranded version of slavery. The fact that that is now being directly addressed and being directly attacked and being directly dismantled is scaring the living hell out of them. And the fact that the people are willing to put their lives on the line, to put their bodies on the line, to serve time or whatever it is, is scaring the hell out of them, right? And so I do think that even though it's as intense as it is right now, it means that we're winning this fight. Right, and that they're on the back foot and they're trying to figure out whatever it is that they can do to try and, and, and suppress this movement. Now, as far as where I think we can go from here, I think that number one, I don't wanna see anyone go to jail, especially for things that they did not do, especially for things that, that, that they were actually the victims of. I don't wanna see anyone go to jail for that. Um, but I also don't want people to stop fighting. But I think that we can find other ways to fight without putting us into these vulnerable positions, right? There's different ways. And I know that there is um, some organizations that are thinking very creatively. There's, there's, there's some organizations who are, are focusing on, on really marching heavily right and and it's powerful it keeps the momentum alive it keeps people active it keeps people out on the streets when they're in georgetown and they're at the bars or whatever or they're going to go shop and then the march rolls by and they hear brianna's taylor brianna taylor's name and they hear no justice no peace and they hear all these things it reminds them that we're still fighting that we're still active and we still need those but we also have other organizations who are putting together panels right who are trying to make sure that people are getting out to vote and making sure people are registering to vote, right? We have other people who are creating coloring books about the movement so that they can start to educate children at a younger age um, about, you know, anti-racist philosophies, you know, and how to maneuver in this, in this police state, right? I mean, this is the fact, this is a sidebar. My father told me how to deal with getting pulled over by the police when I was in kindergarten. Right, like that is something I had to know before I could even count past a hundred. Right, and that's the reality that we live in as black people, right? And I don't think that people really understand that. So when we get out here and we say black lives matter, when we get out here and we fight, when we get out here and we march or whatever it is, when we get out here and we do our sit-ins, when we get out here and we make these coloring books, it's because when we say Black Lives Matter, we mean it. Um, so as far as, I, I don't know, where do we go from here? I don't think that it's really up to the people anymore, right? We've, we're doing what we can and we've been doing what we can for the past four months plus, for the past several odd centuries. It really is up to this government to finally change, right? But also at the same time I say that this government supposedly is uh, for the people by the people, right? So it is up to us to make sure this government does serve us. I don't know how, how we're gonna exactly do that, but I hope that we find a way to do this sometime soon. But um, it's time that we move on to the Q&A. So let's, let's get this started.
Just so one wonderful. It's been a wonderful discussion. I'm almost uh, almost feel bad about cutting in. Um, to the audience out there, if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, put them put it in the, the Q and A uh, uh, box, uh, and I will uh, and we will uh, get to it as, as time permits. Um, I, I want to thank uh, I want to thank uh, Tita for um, for mentioning uh, Richard Collins the third. Um, uh, I, you know, I want to I want to add that you know he was a student at, at Bowie State University, which um, is the oldest HBCU in uh, in Maryland. <clears throat> and uh, you know, we speak about anti-racism um, in education. Um, HBCUs, you know, I think feel like the, the original anti-racist education um, uh, site. Uh, and uh, you know, Tita had mentioned um, um, Thurgood Marshall not not getting into University of Maryland. He found a home at Howard University. Um, so, um, you know, we know education has, has a role in this. And uh, uh, Keon talks about being um, uh, radicalized by his education. Um, I, you know, what is, as, what is the role of, of artists in, um, in, in spreading the ideas um, of, of anti-racism? Ricky, you want to go first? or uh, Please. I would love to hear what you think. I will, I will, I will try to, I'll try this one. I think that artists have an incredible role here to play in this movement because this is, a, this is something that I've always believed in and I stay true to this, that art forms culture and culture forms society, right? And as artists, whether it's whatever form it is, whether you're a photographer, you're a filmmaker, you're an author, you're a painter, you're whatever it is, you're a poet, um, you are producing art that has the ability to change how people perceive certain things. It's going to change how people can think, right? Um, so how do we as people really engage with some of these larger cultural issues, right? We, we watch different films. Maybe it's a documentary. We read different books. We listen to different songs. We have musicians and things like that like look at bob marley right like one of the most extremely radical musicians that we have but yet at the same time is doing so in a way that is promoting peace and love and prosperity right um so i think that artists and, and look at the influence that he had right look at the influence that barry jenkins is able to have look at the influence that here victor is able to have on me right and and on all the other people that has read his work um so i think that artists have an incredible role to play here. And I wanna say almost even a responsibility, honestly, because especially as we get, as artists find that they have a platform where their voice doesn't only just matter, but has influence and can actually change how people think. I mean, like, you know, I, I, I hate, I don't wanna say I hate to think this, but like, you know, who is going to have more of an impact on getting young black women and latino women to vote joe biden or cardi b i don't know the answer to that per se but i have a feeling that if cardi b is like hey we need to get on we need to go vote i feel like a lot of her fans and supporters are gonna be like yeah you're you're right <laughs> we do i don't know if they're necessarily gonna say that with joe biden right um uh or 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 or, or someone else right but these artists, these influence, who was it just the other day, uh, the president of Nigeria had tweeted something out about uh, President Trump getting COVID. And then WizKid had like quoted his tweet and was like, why are you concerned about President Trump? Like your people in your own country are dying like all the time, this and the third. And like the amount of retweets and favorites that WizKid got like completely overshadowed how much the president of Nigeria got, right? And that's to say that the influence that WizKid has as an artist, as a musician, over the people internationally. I don't even know who the president of Nigeria's name is, but I know who WizKid is, right? I think that that's what I'm saying. They, like artists, we have so much power, so much influence um, that we really do have a massive role and a massive responsibility in this movement and making sure that we're on the right side of history. Um, and I would, all I would add, I think Keon is uh, exactly right about the power and the influence of culture for sure. I guess I would just add that the, I think the other thing that artists can do is like, um, 
I think one of the uh, tools of racism is uh, to erase the complexity of the people who are oppressed and to um, to make it seem as though those people never existed and as, as if their lives were not as complicated as those of the dominant group. Uh, and that the beauty of art, I'm thinking in particular here about literature, writing, comics, things like that, is that it can act as a kind of testimony to the fact that people lived and people loved each other, people fought, people did all the things that human beings are meant to do. And it seems like a small thing, but I think it's no mistake that uh, again and again, no matter where you go in the world, one of the things that a culture that is trying to oppress another culture does, works hard to do is to dehumanize the people it's, it's trying to oppress and to erase the sense that they might have humanity in the same way that the dominant group has humanity, because then there might be the risk of thinking that the dominant group was indulging in monstrous acts. But if you erase that, then, um, then there's the chance that people in the dominant group feel less and less terrible about treating these other groups with, uh, with hate and destruction. Uh, so I think that's another thing that art does. It's just, it just reminds everybody that like, uh, the distance between those experiences and between the quality of those lives is uh, non-existent. Yeah. Uh, and that the shame of it is even deeper if you acknowledge that. Now, Kian, you talked about um, the work you've been doing um, and and, uh, and getting out there and taking pictures and um, and, and some of the stuff you, been, you were saying was harrowing, being shot out, uh, arrested, um, and uh, you even talked about having PS, PTSD. Uh, my my question um, is, how do you how do you create um, under under those under those circumstances, and and how are you taking care of yourself? Great question. Uh, not even gonna lie, literally right before this thing, I got some really scary news and I had a mini mental breakdown <laughs> literally right before this panel. Um, so, uh, how am I taking care of myself? Uh, trying. <laughs> Let's start there. I try. <laughs> I try to drink water. Um, I try to make sure I eat. I try to make sure I sleep. Um, and I try to make sure that I give myself some time to just breathe right to to relax and unwind for a minute because this stuff is is stressful this stuff is scary and it's terrifying i'm not even gonna like it's beyond scary right um but how do i continue to create i know it's what i need to do i i feel as though that i don't have a choice honestly like this is what I feel as though I've been put on this earth to do, you know? And it doesn't matter how many times I see some of the things that I've seen, I know that I'm still doing what's right. I know that when I got arrested, I didn't do anything wrong and it was the wrong reasons that arrested me, right? So it's, it's knowing that I'm fighting the good fight that keeps me out. Um, and trying to at least remind myself that everything's gonna be okay in the end. And it's not even just me, like I, I'm not doing this alone. No one can do any of this alone. Um, it, it, it is extremely important that you have a support base, that you have people who are in your corner that you can rely on, that you can talk to about all of these things, um, that you can hug, you know, after it's all said and done. I mean, like when I was finally, I, I spent 17 hours in lockup and not knowing when I was going to eat, not knowing when I was going to get water, not knowing when I was going to get hand sanitizer. We are in the middle of a pandemic. And when I got out, there was like a good, I don't know, 50 people on the outside. I mean, it wasn't just me. That, that time that I got arrested, there was 41, there was 40 other people that got arrested that time. So there was a whole bunch of people that were waiting for all of us to get out. Um, but I remember 100% walking up the ramp from Central Cell Block and seeing 
all of those people at the top of the ramp, just cheering, just so happy that we were finally out. And that was certainly a moment that radicalized me even more, I'm not gonna lie, but it was also another moment that made me feel safe. Mm. That made me feel that when I'm out here, even when things are hot, even when things are scary, even when it's literally spicy because they're pepper spraying people, <laughs> um, I'm still gonna be safe. We, we keep us safe is one of the biggest phrases that has been chanted throughout these past couple of months. We keep us safe. And it has been my time out here in the past four months um, with, with the people of the movement that have not only been saying that, but have been proving it. And that's what keeps me out there. That's what keeps me creating. Uh, the, the, the question that you, that, that was asked about, um, about literature and, and English, that, that question sort of blew my mind. <laughs> um, I, 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 as a, as, as a last as a last question, um, I, I would wanted to ask for both of you who who is doing that the, the work of that literature under the, the big broad category as as, as you um, as you however you describe it however you define it who is doing that work that is that's doing it for you that's sort of that's blowing your mind that's uh, that's redefining um, what, what what this uh, what this is uh, what, what this art practice is uh, Victor let's, let's start with you. Oh, well, uh, off the top of my head, the first person I'm thinking of is uh, she just won a MacArthur yesterday. N.K. Jemison yes. is doing uh, amazing work. Uh -huh. uh, that would be the, and she's got one, The City the city We Became, I think is her newest one. I'm reading it uh, now. Uh, okay. And uh, so I would say like she, uh, to my mind, one of the things I really enjoy about uh, her work and some of the stuff I'm like filtering into on the sort of whatever would be called speculative fantasy mm -hmm. side of things is the blend, the way that uh, uh, it's uh, to, to sort of bounce off what uh, Keon was saying earlier, it's a literary conversation, it's a, uh, a written piece of work, but it's also speaking through those genres, it's speaking to just an even larger arena of readers. Do you know what I mean? And in that way, actually helping to potentially uh, shape culture right like in that big broad sense uh and then there's a anthology called new sons that came out earlier this year um and uh dang it i'm, I'm gonna remember in two seconds uh some of the names in it and uh but it's a an anthology of like uh essentially like new speculative fiction from like uh an incredibly diverse uh uh range of writers who um like if you dive into that, you just won't be, um, you'll never, you won't be dissatisfied with any of it. And the beautiful thing is it's, uh, it's just such a broad uh, picture of what the uh, sort of future of st storytelling within the genre can be. So those would be two, two off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, I guess just because I'm so fascinated in all of the different other forms of literature that are out there. Um, you know, one of the people who, I'll get some, some, some of my favorite artists who I think are also pushing those boundaries, uh, Donald Glover, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, because he has proven that as an artist, you can work in all of these different mediums and not only do that, but be amazing at it. <laughs> Um, whether it's through his comedy, through his stand-up comedy, or if it's through his TV shows, or if it's through his music, or whatever it is, he's definitely, I think, you know, one of the trailblazers as far as like these like quote-unquote Renaissance uh, artists or whatever that have kind of like been able to do it all. Um, so he's definitely one of them. Um, and when I was lo looking at your work, I, Glover actually came to mind. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, he he's since I was like in middle school, he's been one of my favorite artists. Um, but he's definitely one. Um, another one, um, his, uh, his, his real name is Steve Ellison, but his, his artist name is Flying Lotus. Um, he's another one of my favorite musicians. And, and the reason why I bring him up is because he's also, he actually studied film uh, in, in college. Um, 
but yet he he made it as a as a musician and he also raps he produces he djs he does this in the third and he also does film work and so i guess he's another one of those people that i guess as far as what i'm saying is like you can like you as an artist don't need to limit yourself to one medium like there are people out here who are doing it all i just found out recently that the rapper waka flocka flame just got a phd in philanthropy right that's amazing that's freaking amazing right this is hard in the paint waka flocka with a phd that's amazing right um so i guess it's 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 i don't know i, I love hip-hop music so i'm looking at all these different producers and rappers who are just doing amazing things but i guess like other other people um you know who are also doing great work uh, i mentioned barry jenkins earlier before um There's so many. I don't know. I don't know. There's there's so many. Um, but I think I'm just gonna I'm gonna leave it at, at the ones that I just named. Um, but I definitely do uh, implore everybody to to open up their minds to what they consider literature. Um, it's more than just books, right? Um, it, it's it's so much more than what we think it is. Um, so I just want. I guess like if there's one thing that I would like for people to like walk away with. Uh, from this from this particular question is uh, read with an open mind all right that's a that's a good uh, good phrase to end this and uh, end this session on we could go on for hours yeah uh, thank you uh, thank you uh, to Victor uh, and, and to and to Keon uh, and and to uh, and to, uh, to Tita for organizing uh, organizing organizing this event and uh, go in peace and uh, with an open mind. Yeah. Thank you for coming through too. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here.